Hello, Brazil, and hello. Thank you so much for having me here. I really appreciate it. I'm excited to be here, and I thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much, John. Um, we've been talking about remote viewing for quite a while, and I'm so excited to talk to someone who's been working with it for over two decades. So yeah. I'd like to start um, recapping your story because not everybody know you well. So could you tell us how did you end up working with remote viewing in the mid nineties? How did it happen? Well, okay, so I went to school and I have a degree in fine art. Oh. I, like I was never in the military. I was never mm -hmm. involved in any of that stuff. Um, but in 1995, I had seen a TV news report um, on remote viewing, and that was that was the first time that it was outed to the public of this psychic technique, this uh, technology to create psychic spies. And I never thought of myself as being psychic to that point. I mean, every single one of us has had a psychic experience, whether we know it or not. And I know I had had that kind of stuff before. And I had been very involved in meditation, Zen meditation, and I lived in a Zen center for a while meditating. Yeah, yeah. So I was, I was really interested in this idea of psychic spies. It was like, if you hear the word psychic spy, it's like this, I don't know, just, just this obsessive ticking in your head starts happening. Psychic spy, psychic spy, what's that? I have to figure this out. So it was at that time that, um, after it became de declassified, there were ex-military trainers. They were already mm -hmm. teaching remote viewing, but it was, I think it was like $10,000 US dollars to take a course. I didn't have that. I mean, I was a starving artist, so I didn't have that kind of money. Um, so I was able to kind of cobble together how to do it through some internet forums. People were talking about it here and there. So I was able to figure it out a little bit, and then I tried it myself, and it was working. It really, really worked. So I eventually, it wasn't long after, that was probably a year or so, I got formal training in it. Now I did not want to be trained by an ex-military person. Mm -hmm. I went to a person named Prudence Calabrese who was working with a place called the Farsight Institute. And oh, that's yeah. a remote viewing institute in the United States. So she had broken off with them and then I started to work with her. Mm -hmm. And it was in that period of time where Everybody was trying, everybody in the civilian world was trying to figure out what can we do with remote viewing? I mean, it, you know, everyone's viewing conspiracy and alien stuff mm -hmm. and all that, but what can we do with it on the practical side in order to make a living? So we formed a think tank um, and we had an investor come in and we hired remote, hired and trained remote viewers. And because of that, we were, um, we were brought into some intelligence, United States intelligence projects. Uh, we had worked with um, corporations, major household name corporations, uh, in order to figure out like future technologies, in oh. order to understand how we can fix things in product lines. Uh, I mean, we worked with um, companies in Hollywood to understand like what kind of movies would be hits, like stories we would remote view stories that would be hits and then give them the information. Uh, we worked on um, an alien toy, a toy that aliens play with for a toy <laughs> company. Um, we were, we were, I mean, the projects were pretty much endless, pretty much mm -hmm. endless. And all the while, you know, we, so we had a fully functioning, running civilian think tank. And all the while, the whole time, even though we were working with people in intelligence world and we had handlers in various intelligence agencies, mm -hmm. um, which is a little sketchy to begin with, but there was another covert group from, you know, the government or some government that was trying to shut us down. Mm -hmm. So, so we had a lot of death threats from this group. We were followed all the time. Um, from the um, beginning? More or less from the very beginning, wow. from the very beginning. Um, and it was a weird thing. It was a very strange situation to me because, you know, remote viewing was declassified. And so mm -hmm. that means it goes to the public and the public yeah. can do whatever it wants with it. Yet at the same time, we're being 
like harassed and all they want us to do is shut down, go mm -hmm. away. Um, and after 9-11 in the United States, when the terrorist mm -hmm. attack happened, we started working counter terror for the FBI. And I thought, you know, because of that situation, you know, that other side would let up, but it got worse. It got more intense. So, you know, eventually what happened was we had to shut our doors. We had to close down this particular aspect of the business called transdimensional systems, the running mm -hmm. thing. And that basically stopped that type of harassment. But then I went on, my partner Prudence in the business quit and disappeared. And I went on working on television shows um, like Ancient Aliens and National Geographic and stuff like that. So, so that, you know, there's something really important about this, about remote viewing. It is something that can change the consciousness of humanity in general, because it's not what people think it is. I mean, there is an information gathering side of remote viewing and it's scientific in the process. And I can explain that, but outside of that, in order to be an effective remote viewer, you have to go through a process of letting go of your ideas about things and moving to a different place inside of you where you can sense and feel as opposed to think about it. The thinking brain is the thing that comes to conclusions on things and you have to let go of the thinking brain in order to truly know what's there and what's happening. And it's the same with any deep spiritual practice. Like if you're sitting on a cushion in a Zen center all day, all you're doing is trying to get out of your head so that you can see what's truly happening because it's our, it's our brain, it's our mind that creates our suffering. Our thinking mind creates our suffering and it, it creates a self-identity of who we think we are, which gets in the way of truly knowing what is. And so remote viewing is really a process, even though there's the information and the amazing stories that come out of it, it is a process to let go of aspects of yourself so that you can truly see what, that, what is there. Now, it's not necessarily a spiritual practice, but it has the roots and the underpinnings of it, right? It is, right? It, it's like a spiritual practice, which you give another excuse for, and but the end goal is the same. And right. you evolve spiritually, even though you're not officially doing it for that reason, right? Right, exactly. I understand what you're saying because as an engineer, I used to be super linear thinking, logical and things like that. And at the same time, I had this crazy psychic activity uh, and I didn't know how to deal with that. And it took me over two decades to come to the point where I say, okay, sometimes I need to use my logical brain to get a uh, better and to understand what I received of information from the other side of my brain. <laughs> which is non-linear and usually yeah. comes with better answers. So right. instead, so that's how I do it today with the Akashic Records. I, I just, I open myself to receive the answers. I have no idea what's going to come. I don't even guess because I, I, I've been embarrassed myself enough times trying to guess. <laughs> I don't anymore. But then I use the, my linear brain to understand the information I receive. So that's pretty much how I work it. Exactly. Okay, so so you know the whole um, the story of the ages, the apocal ages, um, like in Hindu, the Kali Yuga, mm -hmm. and there's four apocal ages that they claim humans have gone through, and just about every culture across this planet has these apocal ages, and they amount to about four or five, where it starts with the golden age. The Greeks had it, the golden age, mm -hmm. and it moves to the silver, and then the bronze, and then the iron age, and and these ages are very massive amounts of time, and they're supposed to represent a whole cycle, okay? So we remote viewed the heck out of these ages. And one of the things, so when you go back to the golden age, the golden age was like an age where people were living and they could just get food from the earth. It was easy, there was no toiling, you know, they were connected to each other in a very psychic telepathic way. They were connected to source. They lived connected to source. And then as you go to the Silver Age, things start to devolve a bit. And then the Iron Age, it devolves more. People get more greedy. They get more into themselves and their own self-satisfaction. They lose their, their connection to divinity, okay? Mm -hmm. 
we're in the last age right now, according to this time frame, and the Iron Age. And in the Iron Age, truths become lies and lies become truths. Wow. So and it's the age of wars. Now, when we looked at the Golden Age and how people lived, it was literally intuition first, first, logic second. So the big difference between that and this right now is that people use logic first and intuition second. And that is why people be believe the lies exactly. and they cannot feel the truth. So, so what you're doing is bringing back something from the golden age, because I truly believe that we are moving back into that. Mm -hmm. truly believe we're moving back into that. And that is a huge aspect of it. And that is uh, uh, so important for our world right now to understand how to shift it around. We put intuition first and then let our logic figure out the path that the intuition gave us. So what you're doing is just... Yeah, perfect. perfect. I think it's the perfect uh, way to navigate all the disinformation ocean we have around. Because if right. we use our intuition what we feel it's instantaneous we know when we're being lied to exactly exactly yeah but if we try to figure out with our logical minds we can uh, have very elaborate lies right and we can fall for them <laughs> exactly yeah 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 well you didn't work much with the um with the fbi and all that uh, officially psychic uh, spying counterterrorism and all that but i assume that after a while uh with both sides of let's say the americans and the russians when the whole remote uh, viewing started uh when both sides are doing the same thing probably someone thought about creating fences or psychic defenses and things like that. How does it work? Is it possible to block the remote viewing or um, send it somewhere else in some way? Absolutely. Um, so one of the things about um, humans and remote viewing is that the normal average human can't really block that kind of a thing because for one thing they don't have the awareness uh, that somebody would be remote viewing them and another thing they don't have the the energetic capacity necessarily to move a remote viewer out if they come into them um so so other beings absolutely do so there are there are beings that we've run across and it actually happens quite a bit you know the whole alien or multi-dimensional construct when you remote view those types of beings, they will notice when you're remote viewing them. And if they have things to hide, then they can block you. And normally it's a case of basically just sending you somewhere else other than them. For instance, there was a video called Skinny Bob and you can find it on YouTube. Skinny Bob was an alien. And there was this video that was released to YouTube a while ago and we had remote viewed that video. And when we started remote viewing Skinny Bob, it was, well, first we just wanted to figure out if it was a real thing or some CGI, some computer trickery or whatever. Um, turns out it is real, according to our data. And Skinny Bob at first would allow the remote viewers in and go into his mind and you know, explain what's going on. But then after about four viewers, three or four viewers and a couple sessions in, he started bouncing them out because he got irritated with the viewers constantly going into them and just basically sending them to a nature scene. Um, so that happens. Now, the other side of it, there are like hidden military installations across the world, across this planet that have to do with alien involvement. Mm -hmm. And when remote viewers view those, quite a few of them have what we call viewer traps where you'll start viewing it and you'll kind of get sucked into this uh, just energetic matrix that it feels like you're going somewhere, but you never actually end up anywhere and get any information. Mm -hmm. And it's meant to just sort of like, it's like an energy field. It's like a fourth dimensional energy field that traps psychics who are going in to look at these locations. Wow. Um, 
we've also run across locations where when the viewers go in, they start to hear alarms, alarm sounds. So there's like this, there's an energetic field that when breached um, can set off alarms. Now that energetic field is more fourth dimensional than it is three dimensional. But I've done some experiments building um, uh, like static electricity devices, stuff that ghost hunters use. And some remote viewing of these devices will set them off. And of course, it's like, you know, fine tuning that kind of thing. I'm sure that somebody has, you know, on the terrestrial 3D Earth side. But in anything that I would do to figure it out would be kind of reinventing the wheel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. S super interesting. Uh, because I've been uh, attacked once. I, I think I I've been when I, I think I was seeing a dark fleet ship. Uh, over Argentina, but I didn't even know I was seeing that. Uh, I was uh, the only thought I had in the moment was, "Whoa! If I ever had a UFO, I would hide it in a cloud." And I was seeing something weird, metallic, in the middle of a cloud. But I wasn't thinking of uh, taking a photo or anything like that. But I only thought that, and the next second, bam! Huge headache, and yeah. I had to sleep for two hours to go back to my normal. And only later I said, "Whoa." I think it was real. Yeah. <laughs> for what reason I would have this major headache uh, out of the blue? Yeah, this, this happens all the time. This is common. This is more common than you know. And especially with, with, with someone like you who's, who's going into this world and has this show, these beings are always around and they're always watching and they're always monitoring and they're always looking for ways to push you back to turn you off. I'm sure you've had experiences that you've completely forgotten about too, because they will wipe them from your memory. Yeah, yeah, sometimes. Uh, but but it's usually like that, I feel bad. I have a headache or I feel yeah. stomach ache or something like that. That's usually the sign, mm, there's something <laughs> weird here. Right. Wow. Um, my last question actually was about the uh, if when remote viewing upper dimensional or extraterrestrial beings, you you are usually noticed or not, uh, and what do you do when they notice you? It depends on who you're viewing. So, in remote viewing, okay, the way remote viewing works is that you the remote viewer is blind to what mm -hmm. there is they're going to remote view in order to keep the data very clean. And then we'll use multiple remote viewers and then we'll cross corroborate the data between the viewers to build the picture of what mm -hmm. is going on. Now with alien stuff, you have to be able to trust the person that is wanting you to view it. We call that person the tasker. You have to be able to trust them because as a remote viewer, you don't want to be sent to really, really negative stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. Sometimes we will go in and purposefully view very negative things in order to change them because we'll use a, rem uh, a, re a type of remote healing slash influencing in order to remove threats. So now when you're remote viewing something um, negative and it turns its attention towards you, it now for me and the team that I work with, when it turns its attention towards us and it feels negative, we move into a place that's defensive and that we, and the purpose of us viewing that would be to influence and change the behavior of that by bringing source energy in, in order to just, you know, stop some violation that's going on. Now with good ones, it's no problem. I mean, those are the fun ones. Those are the ones where, um, if they notice you, which they quite often do, they will kind of poke you back. And not just that, you can have a visit, like a literal yeah, yeah. visitation experience by, well, it can be dark ones as well. I've had visitation experiences where dark ones have come and visitation experiences where good ones have come. So, so it's like you become a conduit, you become part of a broader community of beings that exist in a conscious way. I mean, we all are, but most people work that in the realm of their dreams or in their subconscious. 
And I think it's extremely beneficial and really important for us to begin to bring this to the conscious awareness so that we can actually take control of some of the interactions that we're having. Um, you know, it's very interesting you mentioned influencing. Uh, do you usually do that at current time events or you do that in other times? It can be at any time. Oh, perfect. Because I've been doing that uh, through what we generally call the Akashic Records. Okay, yeah. sometimes we have, but it's not like uh, we're going to a play, we don't know where we are going. We have someone who is the, it's another life of someone we are dealing with and we know we have a situation where we can influence people in that situation and we have like a group of 10 people and each one is influencing one of the characters in that story. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. And we can change the story. So, but the whole process is, uh, it feels completely uh, imagination. We cannot prove usually, sometimes we do, but usually we, we just cannot prove. So it can be, the whole thing can be a dream. You can experience as a dream or something like that. But I've been explaining people that uh, changing timelines, that's the way you do it. You right. influence the uh, decisions people will make in that timeline exactly. and everything happens at the same time. So uh, the life you had in the Middle Ages, let's say, it's actually happening now. Right. So right. you can change it right now. Right, um, exactly. I mean, that's the stuff that we found too. It's the same thing. Now, it, as far as proving it goes, like I have a um, remote viewing methodology that deals with um, uh, changing environments and situations. And, and obviously, you know, it's, it's causation versus correlation when you get to these things. But we've applied that to terrestrial situations, like Earth 3D situations, put viewers into it and, and have worked these things where you can see changes occur in the environment. So, so in a sense, it's like that is in a way how you at least prove to yourself that it works to some capacity, right? But you know, when you get into the very esoteric and timeline re related things, it it becomes a little bit more difficult, obviously. But at least if you have some backup on like three D situations that you know you've changed, you can pretty much say, okay, let's apply it to this thing, and we know it works here, so it probably works there as well. Yeah, that's what I usually use. I try to find, uh, when I'm traveling in other times, I try to find information I don't know and check if it's real uh, and things like that. Because sometimes you're, you're actually seeing the situation and you can describe the whole thing, right. whatever's going on. And then I check if, if it's uh, true or not, uh, information that I don't know. And this way I, I started trusting my ability to be in completely other times and places, uh, that's how I started. And then later I said, okay, let's assume that it can be, it can always be imaginary, but it right. might be true. <laughs> right. You're having a fun time nonetheless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mentioned in one of your interviews, uh, you had a lot of uh, ET experiences and you have like CEOs interested in the subject. You had, uh, you have been abducted many times and things like that. Um, do you think it somehow led you to work with remote viewing as a psychic spy or something or not? Is it related? Um. It's all related. Um, since I was a child, I used to get taken out of my window. So I would be going to sleep, laying down in bed, and I could hear these things in my window. And then they would start to like lift me up and then pull me out the window. And then I would end up in the field below my house at like at two in the morning and have to make my way back into the house. And so this would happen when I was a kid. Um, I didn't know what it was. They scared me. Um, I didn't tell my parents because it was just too weird. And so later on in life, when I saw, you know, you, you know Whitley Strieber's book, Communion, and he's got the gray alien face on the front cover of the book. When I, I didn't know anything about aliens. And when I saw that book sitting there, I 
completely freaked out because it was the same beings that would take me when I was a kid. So I, I think that what it is is that these beings, they'll use people for different purposes. And, and my life has been set up in such a way as to be a communicator, um, mm -hmm. to get to the place where I am a communicator and I'm a storyteller to, to a large degree to relate the stories of remote viewing to get people to come into it and change consciousness. And these beings, they notice that stuff. And that perhaps, you know, when I was abducted, they were driving me into that as well. Now, I don't trust them for one thing. So ultimately, I don't know what their end game is with me. I just try to keep them away. I mean, those are some of the ones that we will go after when we're remote viewing in order to get them to change their bad behavior towards humans. Um, you know, any being that has to subdue your mind in order to do things to you, it's not, it's the not best approach. Yeah, yeah. 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 So it could be related. It definitely could be. Yeah. Did you ever try to remote view your experiences to know exactly what they were doing with you? Some of the experience, yes. In the past, I had remote viewed some of them. It was a lot to do with uh, genetic manipulation. Mm -hmm. um, it was, I wasn't so much on the, you know, there's some people who are on the breeding side. There was mm -hmm. a little bit of that, but mostly it was like genetic manipulation uh, as well as, as like turning me more in the way of spirituality and being psychic for whatever reason. So, wow. yeah. Now, uh, uh, do you think that uh, remote viewing would be a way of therapeutical way of getting your memories back? Um, for, because people usually go to hypnosis to remember exactly what happened. Do you think that remote viewing would be another path to get absolutely. to the same results? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when when. I, it's also, it's a kind of difficult to, if a person had an experience and then they wanted to remote view their experience that they had, it can be a little bit difficult to get into that place because mm -hmm. for one thing, they're always going to be blind. And, and, and if they do that session while they're doing the session, they're probably going to realize that it's them with an abduction experience. And while it's going to bring back edges of memories, they're probably going to like have a little bit of a breakdown. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. But you can have other remote viewers. Yeah, exactly. Experience and give them information on it that can trigger something as well, which is, mm -hmm. is typically the better way to go. But you have to be careful because the remote viewers have to be careful because what happens is that these beings that have abducted them can take notice of the remote viewers and then come after them. Yeah, yeah, true, true. Wow, well, <laughs> not an easy situation, no. right? Wow, wow, true, true. Uh, do you have, did you ever find humans who noticed your presence? Um, not necessarily. Uh, there's been times in remote viewing people where there's been, they may, okay, so normally we, something hits our subconscious and most people don't believe what their subconscious tells them. So they'll just push it back and forget about it. And there have been times in remote viewing where I've hit people's subconscious and it's made it to their conscious mind, but they don't believe it. So they just drop it, right? Um, it's not a difficult thing though, to notice a remote viewer. I, 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 I see ghosts, right? I, mm -hmm. I can feel them, feel their presence and see them. And when somebody's remote viewing you, at least for me, the way it works is that I feel it uh, tingling on my back, back of my head and my back. And it's the same for ghosts too. Like when a presence comes in, that's usually how I feel it. And then I'll know there's mm -hmm. something there. So what I'll do is I'll close my eyes to see what it is. I get a visual of it. And when I do that, the focus on a remote viewer tightens up and gets very pointed and I can see a human face and I can see the body that the consciousness is connected to. Um, and then I can identify who it is. Now for ghosts, it's not so much like that. It's, it turns into these sort of like fleeting images of them, their life, and it's not so focused. Mm -hmm. 
Wow, wow. Because uh, for me, the whole, uh, the way I started learning was accessing someone else in another time, let's say in the past, in the past, and then having that person noticing me and and looking at me and saying, what are you doing here? And then oh, I said, oh, um, hello, my name is Thais. I'm here representing your other life. And I'd like to talk to you. And then have this conversation and I said, well, wait, if I'm talking to someone who's in what I consider past, for that person, I'm in the future. So if that person can do that, I can do it too. So wait a minute, this whole linear time thing, it, it doesn't, doesn't work that way. No, it doesn't. Well, that's interesting because, okay, so that's not necessarily remote viewing. Now you've got a lot of energy behind you in order to manifest or be there, right? More so, because remote viewing, the remote viewer is going between uh, sensing and feeling and writing stuff down. So they're like constantly going in and out and back and forth. So they're not like focused in, in such an extreme way as to pop, fully pop in front of another person. Now there was, you know, this does happen though. So one time, and I don't know if anybody saw me or not, but one time we were working, we were in a house and we were all training. It was a bunch of us remote viewers and we were in training. And we all had monitors. So there was a remote viewer and a monitor. And the job of the monitor is to keep the remote viewer going in the session and, and, and then ask them questions later on. So in this session, I'm going back and forth between a house on fire and a person in the house kind of freaking out and running around. And then the other aspect that I was going back and forth on was this other subject in a room that was rounded it had like metal girders and they were looking at maps and looking through scopes so i kept going back and forth back and forth i'm writing it down monitors talking to me and i'm writing it down sensing it and then finally this is probably like an hour into it the monitor tells me to okay go to the house i want you to pr pretend you're the person in the house and i want you to go to the door open it the front door and go outside so, so there's where I stopped doing the paper and I just went into me and I closed my eyes and I actually stood up and I went to the door, I opened the door and I walked outside. Now, in that moment, I saw, I started running in place and I saw a whole city on fire and I knew that I was in Dresden uh, during the fire bombing in World War II. And, and that was, the, that was what I was viewing too. After I got feedback, that's what it was. So I knew where I was. I was running down the street and I started yelling, I'm in, I'm in Dresden, I'm on fire. I'm on fire, I'm on fire. So when I stopped doing that, I had burn marks all over me. For about 15 minutes, I had burn marks. Now I'm convinced that if somebody were there and they weren't running from the fire as well, they would have seen some ghostly subject running down the street screaming. <laughs> <laughs> but that was because I went inside myself as opposed to you know going back and forth between the paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that I usually manifest as a ghost in the body. Yeah. It's, I usually feel I'm a ball of consciousness, an orb, pretty much. Right, 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 right. Some people notice that. And they start talking to orbs. <laughs> right. Exactly. I always talk to orbs. Yeah, yeah. And say, hi. I know. How are you? What do you want? Are you, are you a friend or not? Exactly. And things like that, right? Because sometimes they're not. They're not. Yeah. Yeah. I have a few questions on things you may have uh, remote viewed uh, with the team. Uh, so, I'll just say a few few things and you tell me if you ever try to remote view them because uh, everybody wants to know about them, like uh, the event, the solar flash, uh, and the financial reset, new worth, and things like that. Did you ever try to remote view that? Um, we've, so, okay, it, there's a lot of the, this whole lore around something happening that's destructive, that's coming 
from the sun, from space, and disrupting our way of life here. Um, we actually saw that a long time ago, around the year 2000, because we had been looking at that kind of stuff way back then. Um, we, it was crazy times back then because, you know, not only were we, you know, dealing with counter terror stuff and like, um, I don't know, bad covert groups doing stuff to us. We're all also dealing with this gray alien that would come and give us information on things. And he would literally show up in the middle of the night and he only mostly showed up at Prudence Calabrese's home and he would leave like footprints on the bath mat. And when he was there, like the whole house stunk like um, rotten, like rotten uh, oranges and diapers. Like if you had a trash can full of diapers and rotten oranges, that's like the scent that they have. Um, and so he would give these messages all the time. And one of the messages that he kept putting out there was something called the big event. He, would, he kept saying it over and over again, but he would never say what it was. So we remote viewed this big event. And the big event was literally, there was a mishap in our atmosphere that caused it to go to sort of a zero point energy state, which caused it to this rolling explosion through the atmosphere across the whole earth, which resulted in basically everything just you know dying here and very quickly very quickly so at that same time you had other remote viewers that were talking about the kill shot from the Sun right so we were getting a different aspect of this because we were mainly focused on earth in the atmosphere um, and it was something that humans did in order to protect so it was kind of like this situation where humans um, launch some rockets up in order to block something that was coming at us, could have been anything, and it caused a big problem in our ionosphere that caused this mm -hmm. explosion. So it was an accident to begin with. Now it's like future stuff, when you remote view future stuff, the future stuff can always change. Like, like future events can be shifted back, it can have aspects of it that will start dropping away, it can have other aspects that come in. And especially when you bring remote viewers into a situation, it's like the double slit experiment where the observer affects the outcome of the experiment in physics, that mm -hmm. remote viewers will affect the outcome of these events. So I thought, you know, like when we were remote viewing it, it would have already happened but it hasn't happened. Now, these days when we remote view um, like potential future events like this with the sun, we still get something happening, you know, like maybe five years out from now, up to five years out from now, um, where there's going to be um, massive earth changes, uh, oceans, flooding, tsunamis, uh, problems with the atmosphere, that kind of thing. But I, I mean, I don't, I don't worry myself about that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not a doom. I'm not like I'm not a, a doomsayer in general. To me, it's, it's like every moment is joyous, every moment is incredible, and that's the only place to actually be, rather than always thinking about what could happen. Um, wow. Now, yeah. Interesting. Yes. Uh... I've been once through a hypnosis session and I was asked that. Uh, and my answer was something like a catastrophic event will not uh, lead to uh, the evolution of consciousness. So it's being prevented. Yeah, right. And the person who was asking me was saying, what, it's gonna, not gonna happen? Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. I think some people get disappointed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was kind of disappointed and said, wait, I've been preparing for that for years now. And, you're saying, and then I said, well, when, when I went back, I said, isn't it better for the evolution of the population and the planet if yeah. something catastrophic? It, it may be uh, a sudden change, but not catastrophic. Not catastrophic where it's all wiped out. I, you know, it's, I think that that type of event is, is always on the edges of the books somehow. It's kind of like, like always a potentiality of happening. But on the other side of it, humans get so worked up over what the future may or may not be 
that they'll also want to focus on that kind of stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that, I don't think that's a very good way to live personally, because yeah. there is actually nothing going on. All you have is this moment. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's because we have a lot of memories of catastrophes, and that's a way to program us to create the next one. To create the next one, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I'll get to the questions here. Uh, Anne was saying that if you know something that supposedly blocked the remote viewing beyond 2012 that happened in the year 2000, is it, Anne? Is that it? Yeah. So, so something did something happen around year 2000 that blocked uh, everything? That's, I think you're referring to the looking glass, right? Yeah, they were yeah. In there with uh, trying to find out what would happen after 2012 and uh, the results from the Looking Glass project was timelines would collapse into a single one and ascension was guaranteed. Did you find something like that in the year 2000? Um, okay, so, all right, so we had this handler and he, so a handler is somebody that you deal with in, in, in intelligence and they ask you for things and they help you on certain projects. And he, he came to us once and he said, some scientists are doing something or have done something that may not be good and we need you to check it out to see what they did and if anything actually happened because he couldn't tell us um, what they did because it was classified. Mm -hmm. And we had no classification, nothing like that. So, so we looked at it and it was literally about melding timelines together, collapsing timelines together. And, and it was something that didn't look very good for an outcome because it was like, it was like, it was like mating two things together that shouldn't come together. And so, so I don't know if this is what you're talking about, but, but humans had forced this together in a, in a way that shouldn't happen. And, and after that, I had the distinct feeling that we should be over there, but now we're over here. And there might have been something else that happened later on that cleaned it up and brought it back together because I know that there are other beings outside of humans who are working on removing these negative influences that humans have done to get things going back in the, I don't know, more uh, higher vibrational direction, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. um, one of the weird things also that happened was that, so I, I can always sense the future. I can always sense whether something's going to happen or not happen. It's really easy. It's always been something like that for me. Around, I'd say, 2012, I could no longer feel like what was going to happen unless it was super duper close to me in time. Oh. Like I could usually sense many months out up to a year out and always be correct. But I, like when I would sense out, I could never feel it. And to me, what it seemed like was that there was so much like stitching and shifting of time that it just, you couldn't extend yourself out that far. And it's still there today. Oh. It's very bizarre. And I know other psychics that had the same reaction and still have the same reaction. Uh, would it be the time people uh, say we would be sort of blind and we would have to navigate with uh, blindfolds or something oh, like that? Yeah. What's that from? Do you know where you, uh, where you hear that? I, I remember reading about it like uh, before 2012 in many different places, uh, like uh, predictions that we would have a time. Uh, it was usually associated with catastrophic events, but I remember uh, reading that we would be like uh, in dark places and we, we would have to move around. And I interpret that today as uh, we have to navigate uh, this moment with our intuition, with right. our heart. Yeah. Because we are blind to, because all, everything manifested, we're 
uh, we have lies all over the place. Right. So that's, for me, that's the meaning of being in the dark. Right, right. That's great. I like that. Yeah, that's, that's excellent. The interpretation <laughs> I gave to that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we have a question here. Uh, how do we know if what we access is our imagination speaking or if we actually access remote viewing? Oh, you answered that already. You check with different remote viewers, right? Yeah, it's not just that too. So when you get into remote viewing training um, and you learn how to do it, you get um, what we call tasked on like things out in the physical world. I mean, eventually you can re remote view all sorts of weird stuff, but in training, you really want to stay on the physical stuff so that after you do a session, you can get feedback and look to see how you're doing and, and notice in your sessions what's on and what's off. And so that's how a person becomes really confident in themselves that they can actually do it. And then they'll start to take steps into places that other people would call imagination. And they will know based off of their past experience what's real and not real. Oh, that's interesting because I never tried to do that but that's a good suggestion. I'll try to do it because I'm, I'm usually focused on solving uh, people's right. problems and it's usually emotional and I go to the source of the problem, wherever it is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, can we be attacking dreams? Yeah, absolutely can. It happens to me. It, ha it actually happens when I, most of the time when I leave my body, I'll leave my body at night and then beings will come in sometimes and attack my body. I've woken up with black eye a couple times or a bloody lip and it's been attack and attack, literal attack by some other being. Yeah. It's not, yeah. it's not happy time. No. Yeah. Not nice at all. No. Uh, there are questions about, uh, for example, uh, Nibiru, if you did you ever remote view the Anunnaki, Nibiru, and things like that? Yeah, I mean we've we've okay. So Nibiru, I've all like inside of me. I've always been skeptical of the story that people have of Nibiru coming, um, and with the, the way we remote view, um, we usually when we write up a tasking for a remote viewer, we come from something that's known first. So mm -hmm. in the case of Nibiru, what we would do is if there was something coming towards us from space and people are claiming it's Nibiru and that there are photographs of this thing, then we remote view that particular thing. Okay. And, and we have not yet come across anything that is coming at us. Now, it doesn't mean that something's not coming at us. It just means that we have not yet seen that if it's out there. But now Anunnaki, absolutely, yes, there are Anunnaki, absolutely. Um, we've viewed them quite a bit, um, you know, we like uh, Enki and Enlil and those types of beings, viewed them quite a bit. Um, and they are, they are real. They're more like these, um, uh, you know, human, the humans put them into this mythological category and responsible for certain things but they are beings that have been in existence for a while because they're a different race and they've had a lot of influence on humans and the directions in which humans will grow and in fact you know when you get to a lot of these old stories of like Enki and Enlil and then you go into Ra and uh, the Eye or you go into Osiris and Horus or you even go into some of the Norwegian mythologies they're all the same same they're yeah they're all the same yeah they're all yeah. pointing to these singular groupings of individuals or beings that were influencing and creating part of the earth construct mm -hmm. that's interesting because uh i remember once uh, egypt ancient uh egypt is a time i can easily access and i realized at some point accessing uh a previous another life uh the first thing that uh, puzzled me was that I was looking around and saying, why is everybody so short? What's going on here? 
and then I understood that uh, my position in one of the temples was when people say today uh, the god whatever god egyptian god it's more of a it's not exactly a person but it's a position yeah and the person can change exactly it's like a job right you know, your job at that moment is to be the god whatever right right and it's it's kind of a job and i assume that uh in northern mythology like thor is a job it's, it's a job. exactly <laughs> something like that and maybe yeah. shiva too you know are different jobs with different people playing that role uh in different times exactly yeah that's so, interesting yeah i mean they're all but the, it's like they're all the same i mean all of these yeah. beings are it okay so the, here's the other thing too is that this comes from like way previous earth times where this there was this central thing going on here on the planet and it looked like it probably happened somewhere in Europe in the Alps region where that whole mythology was playing itself out. And then as people, as that culture broke up and people started moving across the world, they took that with them to try to explain what happened back then. And if we, they were dealing with people who could uh, travel in spaceships, yeah. those beings could travel around the planet and show themselves and continue with the exactly. mythology. And right? so mythology. You see yeah. the God, you, you give a different name, but the persona was the same. Right, right. right? So, Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we've seen this with um, ancient civilizations when we remote view them. Mm -hmm. I mean, so this planet has gone through so many renditions of different cultures. And it's so weird right now to me that we're so isolated. I mean, we're not isolated. Yeah. It's just we're made to believe we're isolated. But but in these previous cultures, it was it was normal to have spaceships coming in. It was normal to be connected in. And in fact, this is how most like other planets and solar systems operate, where where beings are going back and forth between other planets and helping other beings on other planets. But here it just it's gotten strange to me here. It's not kind of boring, right? <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> we're somehow confined here or something like that. Yeah. Uh, Anne is asking, how long does it take uh, to become a good remote viewer? How much training you need? Well, it just, it depends on the individual, for one thing. Um, it's like playing an instrument. So some people can get so good that they can play in the orchestra, right? And some people, you know, may not ever get there, even though they practice a lot. So normally, though, with remote viewing, I would say about a year working on it on a very consistent, strict, disciplined basis would likely get somebody to a state where they can be used for operational type things. Um, and operational is I'm talking about like paid jobs and really being able to figure things out for, you know, the person who's the hobbyist, you know, one thing that happens with remote viewing is that when a person first learns it, they have a very high skill level. It's really high. And the reason why is because they don't know their conscious mind can't figure out what's going on. So it can't really control it, try to control it. So I would say after four, five, six practice sessions, when they first learn, they're like doing really well. Then all of a sudden, boom, they crash and burn, total crash and burn. And most people give up at that point because of all the shame that they feel, you know, and they can't understand why all of a sudden they're crashing and burning when they were so good before. And the reason why is because their mind was out of the way, their thinking mind. As soon as their thinking mind tries to take control of the situation, the ego, which it inevitably does, it always wants to, um, that's when you actually begin to learn. But most people give up at that moment when you actually need to start learning. <laughs> so, you know, you have to get through that part. You got to get through the part of like, oh, I feel so bad because now I'm really horrible at this. So I'm just going to quit doing it. So. Great, great. Great. So, one year, okay, Anne? One year. One year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did you recently remote view something about uh, the 
battles in uh, on the moon and on Mars to know if uh, they're over or are we still, you know? Oh no, this fighting? stuff. This stuff is always going on. It's always going on. I mean, it's it's not it's it's not ended to oh, any degree okay. that I've seen. Um, have you ever? Do you have night? You probably don't have night vision goggles, but no, I don't. <laughs> I have night vision goggles and I will lay in the backyard at night and watch the sky. Mm. You would be amazed at what is going on up there. We've seen, I've seen ships flying and shooting stuff. I've seen like battles occurring up there and we've tasked on some of these things as well. What was that? Well, they're, they're, we've seen like Americans in ships fighting like with anti-gravity ships outside of the atmosphere with other beings and i mean you 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 have physical um uh proof of this and it, if you're looking through goggles or if you're filming through goggles and as well as that you have remote viewing data and this is more this is recent stuff too so so this there is something going on there is still something going on for sure wow Wow. Yeah. So guys, night goggles. Okay. Next purchase. <laughs> What's your thoughts about Atlantis? Uh, do you have uh, some hint from remote views on the Atlantis of light or when of the fall of Atlantis? Or we were looking at, we've, well, we've mostly looked at um, the fall, the fall mm -hmm. of Atlantis, as opposed to like what it was beforehand and who set it up and who was there. Um, so we've looked at that specifically um, a number of times, and a lot of what we'd seen was was there was a um, a devolvement uh, spiritually within the culture, where they were um, doing a lot of strange genetic experimentation, but it had gotten to a point that it was beyond what should have been done, beyond what what should be done, as well as they just lost connection to their own divinity to a certain degree. And what we saw was that there was this, this piece of this like piece of divinity or God source that came in that tried to remind everybody. And so it was like this, this, this being came and the people that noticed it could see it, but others couldn't see it. And that precipitated the end or the destruction of that land to, um, to go into a different evolution and that those beings there would would recycle and reincarnate into earth life and kind of play out their atlantean story until that they can come to some type of resolution with it wow was that some sort of christ consciousness it was it was it was some kind of christ consciousness but it came down in a pure form like a pure form of crystalline light energy as opposed to like a person or a being. And you know, see, this is the thing. So humans will not trust uh, like things that are not human. They will either place them in God status or something else. So these beings have to reincarnate into our cycling right now for the mass majority to begin to believe them and the light that they carry and the, the teachings that they bring. Otherwise, people just won't believe them. I mean, if you had a, a light being come down in the middle of culture right now and explain things to people or give them energy, most people would just treat them as a god again. And that's not what's supposed to happen. That's not what, what's supposed to be. So, yeah, but in Atlantis, they were able to recognize that. Um, and it was okay to do, apparently, back then, because they wouldn't end up treating it as a god because they would internalize the experience and grow from it. Mm -hmm. I have crazy memories from the fall of Atlantis. I remember uh, the feeling I had was that it was like the, you know, the big one, the earthquake that will sink uh, California. Yeah. Everybody knew it would happen. The fall of Atlantis yeah. would fall. And people uh, knew it, but it didn't have a date. You know, you, you just kept this feeling, it's going to happen, it's going to yeah. happen, it's going to happen. But yeah. you didn't know exactly when. And uh, after a while, we started feeling it was closer and closer. And the whole society was very dark. 
yeah. uh, consciousness was very dense. And I, I wasn't uh, like one of the important people there, but I started doing something like smuggling uh, objects and people out. Yeah. And hiding them uh, in a cave. That's and, really interesting. Yeah. And, but I remember it was very dangerous because people yeah. couldn't find out I was doing that. And it felt like a Star Wars movie the empire in the Star Wars movie, it felt like that, the the, the society right. at, at that point. Well, and, yeah, I mean, that's that's what we saw too with remote viewing, that it, it did, it went very dark. I mean, it wasn't just like genetic experimentation, it was straight up bestiality. Yeah, it was, uh, the whole society was like, oh my God, you know, yeah. Yeah, the best way to survive was to hide, uh, hide yeah. your light, and, and and I started to like hiding things, right? <laughs> and like people and things, so people would so, suddenly just oh, someone disappeared. Oh, my. <laughs> don't know what happened, <laughs> and things like that. So that's how we saved some of the technology, some of the people uh, that survived the the fall, but just like very few people. Yeah. Um, we ha oh, uh, did you remote view any interaction between the Anunnaki and Atlantis or in no, Atlantis? We didn't. We didn't. But we we did see that um, there was connection with other star races with Atlantis, at least like in the earlier days of it. It may have somewhat left near the end. But in the earlier days, Atlantis was definitely connected into other star races. And it was a it was a public thing. It was like on the surface. It wasn't like it is now for us. But I don't know who they were. Like in remote viewing, we don't, if, if somebody's remote viewing aliens, they don't necessarily get a name for things because a name is this high level concept. Remote viewers describe. So they'll describe mm -hmm. the physical descriptions of these beings, but they won't necessarily describe or give them a name. Yeah. Oh, and uh, there's a question here. Uh, did you get the location of Atlantis? Was it in a specific place, different colonies? No, no we, didn't get, we didn't get a location. That's also another thing that, um, unless we use dowsing, so mm. remote viewers will describe things, but they won't like necessarily get, so, we'll, so we can do, Things like, you know, the um, the re re recot structure, the re mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm. the eye of the Sahara, right? The eye of the Sahara. So yeah. we've looked at that to try to understand what that used to look like, and it 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 was actually that wasn't Atlantis. We looked at that. Um, that one was something that um, was a, a big mining pit and a very ancient mining pit. This is like past past Earth cultures and sl they had slaves mining this area for specific things. And there were aliens involved in that as well, as far as the mining goes. So we'll look at like locations of collapsed structures under the water to remote view what they used to be like. But we've yet to find anything that is Atlantis, but at the same time, it kind of doesn't matter too much because during Atlantis time, there was lots of different cultures here that were very similar to it. It wasn't just that. If for whatever reason, Atlantis like floats to the surface of our consciousness right now, but there are tons of other like lost civilizations that have been actually well documented through photographs of structures under the water. So, you know, I mean, we don't know where it is. We don't know. All right. I think that's it. Um... You have courses on remote viewing and you have your channel. So can you tell uh, the public where can they find you, your courses and things like that? And if it's online, because we're in Brazil. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, yes, they are online and you can find it at righthemispheric.com, my website and their classes. And I'll be teaching uh, coming up, I think it's September. I've got a class coming up. I've got a book. Time Before the Secret Words, uh, kind of a biography of the early days of remote viewing. Um, and yeah, I think that's about it. 
Uh, do you still have the show Psychic Spy on Edge of Wonder? Yes, that is still running on Edge of Wonder. I forgot to mention that. Yeah, two seasons on Edge of Wonder, um, uh, Chronicles of the Psychic Spy. Great, great. So thank you so, so much. It was a pleasure talking thank to you. you. Thank you for having me. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much. Fantastic. So bye-bye. Uh, thank you.